Hey, what's up everybody? Today I'm gonna to answer some of your questions. So most of you know that this YouTube channel is sort of a side thing for me. By day, I'm a professor of computer science at Clemson University School of Computing, and some weeks I have time to post a really in-depth video, a big long tutorial with a lot of code and all that comes with that. Some weeks, life's just kicking my butt, and this is one of those weeks, and so today, I decided, well, I still wanted to check in. I wanted to let you know that I'm still here. I still care about you. I'm still thinking of you. And I also know that I don't get to answer all of your comments on all of the videos that I see come in. So today I thought, hey, why don't we just answer some of your questions? So I got a bunch of questions here. Let's see where this takes us. So the first one is, hey, I'm so thankful for your tutorials. I just want to give you a suggestion. It's better to use size of serve adder instead of size of serve adder with parentheses to emphasize that size of is not a function and that it is an operator. You would have known this, but just saying brackets are necessary when you use size of on a type name. So first of all, thank you for the pointer. It's always good. I always love to hear feedback on the code that I write. Some of that code is definitely written in a hurry and may or may not be the best code I've ever written. The other thing I really like about this is that it brings up a really good point, is that whether or not you believe that you should leave off parentheses or not when using the size of operator, the point is that a lot of people don't understand that the size of operator is an operator. They think it's a function and it's not. It's an operator that the compiler uses. So it's something that's handled by the compiler specifically rather than a function that's just got code that somebody wrote like any of our other programs. If you set out to write a size of function that does what size of does, you're going to have a really hard time because that's just not how size of works. So while I'm not sure I'll be taking this advice, I really appreciate the feedback and I appreciate the perspective. And I really like that this was not just hey, I just like it this one way. I think it's prettier this one way. It actually had an educational point to it that was, hey, if I leave off the parentheses, it conveys the message to the programmer that, hey, this is an operator. And so treat it as such. And I like that. Okay, next question. This is from Henry. Hi, Jacob. Are you planning to do some C++ tutorials? Uh, maybe. Do you want more C++ tutorials? You see, I don't see this channel as a C channel or a C++ channel or whatever. I see this as a programming channel and I tend to draw content from the material that I'm working with with my classes. One of the main classes that I teach is operating systems and I tend to use C in that class. So there's a lot of C content on this channel, but let me know down in the comments if you would like to see more C++. I'm happy to do more C++ as well as things like Python and Ruby and JavaScript and Java, whatever else happens happens to be really interesting to you, I'm definitely happy to take a look at it. Okay, next question. Uh, this is from Mega175. We have, are the arrow operator and the dot operator the same? Uh, no, but they're very similar. So this is definitely a beginner question. Many of you already know this, but in case you're wondering, the dot operator is for structs or classes. If you have a struct or a class type, you would use the dot operator to select one of its members. The arrow operator is for when you have a pointer to a struct or a class and it just prevents you from having to dereference the pointer and then use the dot operator. So this is basically shorthand for this, but otherwise they are of course very, very similar. Okay, next question. Hi, Jacob, I see that you really like Clang. Is there a special reason that you don't use GCC? Just curious. Uh, and it looks like actually the next one is the same question. Is there an advantage of using Clang over GCC? Yes, you will notice that I use Clang and GCC in my examples. Honestly, at this stage in my life, I don't really see one advantage over the other. Now, of course, there are Clang enthusiasts and there are GCC enthusiasts, and they will argue different points like, yeah, GCC is available on more platforms. So a lot of times, especially when I'm doing embedded systems development, I'm often using GCC purely because that's what's available for the platform that I am using. But of course, many platforms have Clang front ends as well. And so in that case, I don't really have a preference. So years ago, I did have a preference and that was not really a strong preference, but it was based on the fact that Clang seemed to have slightly more helpful error messages, slightly better error messages than I would see with GCC. And so I tended to prefer Clang over GCC whenever I had the choice, but I've actually noticed that the error messages in GCC have improved a lot in the last decade. And so I don't really have a strong preference. Use whatever you like. Okay, next question. What is the name of this code editor? Okay, so this is a question that I bring up because I get it a lot. A lot of people are like, hey, what editor do you use? What, what's in this video? Now, it depends on the video that you're looking at. Most of my recent videos are using VS Code. I just really like the way that it brings the terminal together with my code. I like the way it does syntax highlighting and code completion. And there are a lot of useful plugins that make my workflow easier but it's also pretty lightweight. So I can run it in a virtual machine or something like that. And I don't really, it doesn't slow things down too much. Now, if you're watching some of my old videos, I used to use Atom a lot. I like Atom, it's a great editor. It's just a little slower, it's a little more sluggish. And I found that when I was using it on virtual machines, 
it was giving me some trouble. Also, occasionally you'll notice me using IDEs, like particularly the Arduino IDE when I'm doing an Arduino video or an Arduino example, and that's just because it's easy. But you all know me, you know that I'm not a huge IDE enthusiast, and I've talked about why in some of my former videos. I'll put some links in the description. But most of the video material that you're gonna see on this channel is using Atom if it's the older stuff or VS Code, which is more recent. I see them as pretty interchangeable except for the performance issues, which does make VS Code my current favorite. But that said, if you have another editor that works well for you, don't worry about it. Like, it's not that big of a deal. The point is that you have an editor that helps you work through code efficiently and effectively and helps you get the job done quickly. And so if you are a VI enthusiast and you're just like, this is the end all and be all and I just love VI, use VI. It's fine. There's nothing wrong with VI. Same thing with Emacs or whatever you happen to prefer to use. And if you do have a favorite editor that you think I'm neglecting, please make sure to mention it down in the comments and let me know why you think I should work it into the rotation, into my my videos. Okay, next question. So I have a question not actually related to the topic, but should a beginner university student who is more interested in embedded systems more than web development learn HTML, CSS for one year? Basically saying, should I learn web development, CSS, HTML, whatever, if I'm really more interested in embedded systems or low-level systems programming or whatever, something else? And this is always a really hard question to answer because everything is a trade-off. If I spend more effort on embedded systems, I'm going to be stronger in embedded systems if I spend more effort effort on web programming, I'm going to be stronger on web programming. Obviously, there is a limited amount of time in my life, and there's only so much that I can learn in that limited amount of time. And so there is a point where we need to prioritize, where you need to decide what do you want to specialize in, what do you want to be really strong in, and whether you want to dive super deep into a particular topic and be the world expert on that topic, or if you want to be a little more broad and know a lot of different technologies. Personally, even though my specialty is embedded systems, I have spent a fair amount of time on web development, and I actually find that that's a really useful set of skills for me to have. There are a lot of practical tools that I've built over the years that help me do my job better and that all use web development frameworks like Django or Rails or different web technologies and more and more things are on the web these days. And so I definitely don't think that you're wasting your time to learn HTML, CSS and JavaScript and, and all the things that come with web development. These are really powerful, really useful and very relevant technologies. And so even if your dream is to be a low level embedded system specialist, I don't think it's a bad thing spending a little extra time to learn web development and some other aspects of the technical ecosystem that we're in. It definitely makes you a more well-rounded technologist and it definitely is going to help you see opportunities as you're building larger systems to see where your embedded systems and the cloud and the web and some of these different technologies can fit together in ways that will make your systems better and so that's definitely a reason to pursue this hey folks that's all the time i have for today i hope it was helpful for those of you celebrating thanksgiving have a happy thanksgiving i'm thankful for all of you thank you for all of you who support this channel and help me do the work that i'm doing and until the next video i'll see you later